Hi everyone, and welcome to Eric's Electronics Workbench. So on the bench today, I have this Kepco model ABC25-4DM programmable DC power supply. Now the power supply looks like it's really clean and in good condition. It sure doesn't look to have much use on it, but it definitely has a problem when you turn the power onto the unit. Uh, that problem is obvious right away. Now I don't have a schematic for this power supply. It doesn't look like the schematic was readily available. I did some searching online, couldn't come up with that. So let's start in on the troubleshooting without a schematic and see what we can do to bring this power supply back into service. So let's get started. Before I power up the Kepco ABC25-4DM DC power supply, and we'll start in on the troubleshooting, let's take a look at the general layout and the front and back panels. Now Kepco is a manufacturer that makes very high quality power supplies and instruments, and this appears to be no exception. The top cover on this power supply is a very thick gauge of steel. You can see even with these perforations in here when you press down it really doesn't flex at all. So um, really nice quality power supply. It looks like the fit and finish on this supply is really nice. So it'll be interesting to see when the cover is taken off how it looks inside as well. Now this power supply is rated 0 to 25 volts DC at 0 to 4 amps output. It will do constant voltage and constant current modes. So uh, let's take a look at the front panel here and we can see we have a liquid crystal display over here for the uh, operating parameters that are entered in and the output voltage and current uh, ends up displaying over here. Main power switch, the output terminals, so the positive output, negative output. This is chassis ground. This is not a uh, dual output power supply. So this is just chassis ground, it's just a single output. So you have your positive connection here, negative here. Sensing terminals out here, the, there's a link between the uh, sense terminal and the positive and the negative sense and the negative terminal. You can take that link out of there if you want remote voltage sensing, uh, which will compensate for any voltage drop in the wires or your test leads from the front panel to the load. Keypad over here for entering the various operating, uh, you know, parameters and, and settings. So the main one we have a output on and off, voltage setting, current setting, local control. This can be remote controlled uh, over a, uh, a GPIB bus. Looks like a reset, store and recall. Looks like there's uh, some main uh, memories, you know, uh, setups in the power supply, a menu to access some other settings and so on. So anyway, uh, the uh, keypad well laid out there. Looks like a calibration, maybe some built-in calibration there. And down in the corner here, the main ratings. Bring that up a little closer there. All right. I can tell you this is a switch mode power supply without even opening it, because when you hold this power supply, given what it's rated at, it doesn't have, you know, that heavy weight of a big transformer in it. So very likely to be a switching power supply or switch mode power supply. Also, there is no cooling fan in this power supply, which is nice because it doesn't draw in dust and, and uh, lint and things like that, so it stays very clean. So just convection cooled, but also uh, the fact that it's a switch mode power supply runs very efficiently, so it doesn't need that cooling fan. So on the back panel here, we have the remote control, if you want to use that feature over here for the GPIB bus, or IEEE 488 port, all right. Power cord goes over here, standard uh, power cord connection. See the, uh, get the glare off of it there. You can see the readings marked on the uh, data plate. So multiple input voltages. Pretty, pretty typical, what you'd expect to see. And the main output voltages and readings. And under this uh, cover right here is a terminal strip and it also has the DC output. This is the same as what's on the front panel. All right. So the next thing that I'll do is power this up. I'll reposition the camera so we're looking uh, right on the front panel and we'll turn this uh, power supply on and we'll take a look and see exactly what the fault is and uh, we'll start the troubleshooting. So I'll be back in just a minute. I have the power cord attached to the Kepco ABC25-4DM. I also have my Fluke 853 digital multimeter attached to the front panel binding post so we can monitor the output voltage. So let's turn the power on, take a look at uh, exactly what the fault condition is. 
So it does a quick self-test. Looks like the internal memory passes. And then we can see a definite problem. It says overcurrent, and there is no load connected. It's These uh, leads are just going to my digital multimeter. So it says overcurrent, and then constant current, constant voltage is toggling. The LOC in the upper left corner just means local control, so that's normal. And then the digital multimeter is indicating a negative 0.464 volts. If I hit reset, now uh, it jumps to 20, over 25 volt output, 25.27. Um, you can see on the display a lot of jumping around and a lot of toggling on the voltage and current. So that's definitely not right. So we definitely have a problem there. Meters turned off there. So if I come over here to voltage set, try 10 volts, enter. So it ignores the voltage input that I tried to set. It's just stuck at 25, hit output off, stays on, so that's not right. Hit reset. So we can see there's definitely a problem. Now, here's the thing. I've cycled this power supply on and off uh, several times, and I've discovered that after it runs for a few minutes, maybe as much as 10 minutes or so, it kind of depends on the ambient air temperature it seems, but um, the power supply will begin to function correctly uh, once it warms up. Now, it doesn't particularly get that hot on the top cover here. You know, there, already there's just a slight warmth here, but you know, really minor. It's not that much for the, the heat that comes out of it. Like I said, this power supply is switch mode. It runs efficient anyways. But just sitting here with no load connected, you know, it really barely gets above room temperature anyways. But after it operates for a fairly short amount of time, the fault will go away and the output is very stable and appears to function correctly. If you shut the power supply down and turn it back on immediately, it will come right back up and work correctly. But if you shut it down and let it wait for you know, maybe 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes, again, it you know varies just a little bit, but enough to cool off. Uh, the fault comes back. And then if you let it sit and warm up a little bit, the fault goes away. So it really appears to be a thermal issue, uh, thermal perhaps with a faulty component, or maybe a cold solder joint, cold solder connection, loose connection somewhere. I'm leaning more towards a faulty component because if it was a broken solder connection, it seems like if you were to jar the instrument around a little bit like this, it might have an effect, might change things, and I've not been able to have it, you know, change by, you know, bumping or tapping the instrument in any way or the power supply. So, um, again, when we open it up, we'll take a closer look and see if we can zero in on exactly where that problem is. Um, but it really seems to be a thermal issue with a component or a connection. Now, if I hit reset, okay, now it's gone to all zeros and the output has now gone to zero. Let's see if we can do voltage set, 10 volts. All right, so now we do have a voltage. It accepted the input, got 10 volts. Do a current set. So the current was preset to a very low value. If I say two amps, that would current limit uh, or go into the constant current mode at two amps at that point. What I'll try is I'll short the test leads together. So we do see that. Um, you can see here I've got the leads shorted. So that's in the constant current mode and it's right at 1.999, right at two amps. So no problems there. The voltage is just a voltage drop that occurs through the test leads at that uh, two amp setting. Take the short circuit away, test leads are open, and we're back to the 10 volts that we entered. So once it starts to function, it appears to be okay, but there's definitely something going on um, initially, you know, when the power supply is turned on. And again, it seems to be uh, temperature related. Now the output uh, voltage and also the current over here are readings that the power supply takes uh, from the front panel terminals. They're not uh, numbers that are from what you've entered. So for example, if I go voltage set 10.15. So it says 10.151, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.15, 10.
which is, you know, what I did enter, but it says 151, 10.45, okay, but again, it's holding at 10.15, so that's what I entered. It's saying the reading is just slightly different than this or about the same, but again, this reading is uh, what it measures at the terminals, not just a duplicate of what you've typed in. So it's a confirmation of what the output really is. So the next thing that I'll do is take the top cover off and let's have a look around inside the power supply and see if we can narrow down exactly where the fault is. So I'll be back as soon as I get the power supply opened up. I have the top cover removed from the power supply. You can see that cover, very heavy gauge steel. You didn't mess around with that. There's some pretty good weight just in that cover. So very nice power supply, very well constructed. Inside looks very clean. It uh, certainly was well taken care of or in a clean facility. Um, it looks very, very nice inside. So well laid out. It looks like high quality components were used. And again, just a very nice design to the power supply. It is a switch mode power supply or switching type power supply. You can see the transformer there. And it looks like another transformer right there, but the physical size of those transformers is very small compared to what you'd have if it was a 60 Hertz transformer with a traditional uh, linear type regulator. Now there are some devices on a heat sink back here in addition to these heat sinks that we see in here. So there may be some regulation going on um, after the transformer. Some uh, these could be series pass regulators at some point. I don't know their overall layout, um, but again, it is a switching power supply. So very efficient. There's no fan for cooling. And the circuit board over here is, uh, looks like the control circuit board. There's a microprocessor over here. Looks like uh, some memory uh, type uh, circuitry over here, memory chip. Looks like it's been uh, programmed as it says KEPCO, copyright 1987-88, revision 4.2. There is a, a voltage regulator right here, and that's probably what was producing a little bit of warmth so that'll be an area that we'll want to look at. Anything that typically gets warm when it operates is something that you know could be uh, having a thermal issue and causing that fault. So we'll take a look at that in just a moment. So I'm going to concentrate on this circuit board to start with just because of how the power supply was acting. Um, it didn't seem to be going you know completely dead. It wasn't like the switching portion of the power supply was having the fault. It, to me, it seems more of a control issue and it looks like that would probably be on this board over here. So we'll start with this board, and uh, if it's not there, obviously we'll move on to another area, but uh, that'll be the starting point. Now, because the faults seem to be uh, thermally related, and it warms up a little bit, and then the fault goes away, to try and find this problem, I'm going to use a heat gun, and I'm just going to gently warm the circuit board, and we'll see if we can detect or cause the component um, that's acting up, or if it is a solder connection for that matter, uh, if we can just narrow down that area, that's the, the main start right now. So I'm going to turn the power supply on, the digital multimeter is just connected to the front terminals like it was before. We'll watch this, we'll see if there's a change on the meter when I start to warm things on the circuit board. Now the heat that I'm using is right here, it's on a very low setting, really it's lowest setting. So just a very slight amount of heat, nothing that would damage the circuit board or the components. And if you're following along, you do so at your own risk. Power supply like this uh, certainly has lethal voltages inside, so you need to know what you're doing. Um, there's exposed AC line in this power supply in this corner over here. Um, there's high voltages over here. Sometimes these heat sinks can be electrically hot. So you never want to reach in and touch one of these heat sinks. It's assumed that you wouldn't be coming in contact with those heat sinks because, of course, the cover would be on the power supply. But uh, it's not uncommon to see a heat sink that's in the power supply like this that is floating above ground potential. So you'll want to be very, very careful about, uh, you know, reaching in and touching a heat sink to, you know, see if it's warm or something like that. That can be very dangerous and produce a, a very nasty, if not lethal, shock. So use care, use caution. If you don't know what you're doing or unfamiliar with the power supply or the components, please refrain from working on something like this until you fully understand the uh, dangers involved. So take care and be safe. 
All right, let's uh, turn this on. All right. So I'll hit reset, and our fault is there because it's come back to 25 volts. Pardon the noise, the heat gun. We're just gently warming things here. Aha! So we have a change already. So when I got over into this area here, it changed. Interesting. Turn that off. So again, when I got into this area over here with that heat gun, I didn't even make my way all the way to the end of the board. Um, Nothing was changing as I was going around here, but in this area right here, it definitely had an effect. So the next thing that I'm going to do is to try and cool the component back down. And for that, I'll be using this component cooler, all right, freeze spray. And you can see it's non-flammable, safe on plastics. This is designed for working on electronics, and it's intended to chill components when you have an issue that's uh, thermally related. So it's basically like a refrigerant. It gets extremely cold. You can see it uh, says chills to negative 62. All right. And um, it's very, very dangerous. You do not want to get this on your skin because it'll basically cause a burn because it gets so cold. So you want to use this with caution. You also don't need to use very much on the component because it gets so cold so fast. So what I will do is, if I zoom in a little bit closer here, that you can still see the meter over there. I'm gonna hit reset again. Looks like it's holding. The front panel says zero, so. So it was in this area over here. There's a component right up in the top. So what I'm going to do is just apply a slight amount of this to this top component right here. Really no change there. Change there, no, nope. aha, something changed. It did, it did change there. Let's see, there's another. Yeah, it says over voltage, so that fault has come back again. Yeah. Okay, let me do this. I'm gonna go back to the heat gun and just warm that area again. Okay, you can see warming that area right in here made this change again. Yeah, it looks like the fault is now gone. All right. So let's try freezing this component again right here. Yep, the fault is back. Yep, the fault is definitely back. So we may have zeroed in this integrated circuit right here. Tip of the straw is pointing out right there. Seems like that particular component is pretty touchy when it gets warm or cold. What we're going to do is reposition the power supply on its side. Move this over here. The reason is the refrigerant spray is dripping down and I want to hit these uh, components again up here and not have the refrigerant drip down. Let's see if I can turn, yeah, if we can see all of that, kind of a little bit tricky to get it all in the camera here. This is really going to need to sit about like so. Just over a little bit here.
Okay, so it's working right now. I was able to enter 10 volts and it accepted that input. So since it's working, let me chill this component again here. We'll start, so it was in this area right here. I'll start with this top one right up in here. It'll be this, it has four uh, lead, little leads on it, two on each side. in the camera how it turns a uh, real icy white and then zoom in a little bit closer over there doesn't seem to be this particular component but I'll hit it again hit the component below it here let's see No change on the output. Those definitely are not having any issue. You can see how they turn white with the ice on them. Very, very cold. So those two components haven't changed the output. It's remaining very stable. Let me, there's another integrated circuit that's just under this ribbon cable. I'll hit that one again. Uh-huh, yep, that was it. As soon as that one got chilled, the output voltage uh, went up to 25 and the fault came back. So, move this here. Just grab this here, and it looks like. component right here. Can't quite get the light. There you go. So just right there. Looks like that's the one that's faulty. Definitely has an effect when that component it has either heating or cooling applied to it. Um, so right now it looks like the power supply fault is still there. Yeah, it's still toggling around and, and jumping around. I'll warm it up a little bit. Okay, looks like the fault has gone away. this position this like so what I'm going to try and do is get the meter and that component in the same shot here pardon all the camera movement set the output will go voltage set 10 volts so you can see it's working correctly right now. And this component right there, we'll hit that with the freeze spray again. There it is, there's the fault. All right, so it looks like we've narrowed it down to the component that's giving us the problems. zoom in and see exactly what that part is. So the writing is very small, but the marking on this component and actually this one above it is the same. This one is the one that's giving us trouble and it says QTC and then it looks like 740L or maybe 0L 6000. So that looks like the part number. Let me look that component up and see exactly what that uh, part is. So I don't have a 740L6000 in my parts bins, so I'm going to have to order that component up. It appears to be a high-speed opto-isolator or opto-coupler. 
So it looks like probably in the data line, um, in the circuitry, it's right near the microprocessor and some of the data lines in here. I'm just uh, guessing at that, but it, it's uh, called out when you look up the uh, specifications online that it's a high-speed optocoupler. And again, that part number is 740L6000. So I'll get one of those ordered up and I'll be back when the part is in. We'll get that installed. It's been about a week and the new high-speed optocoupler has arrived. So you can see it here, ready to install. So I have the power supply disassembled a little bit further so that I can gain access to the back side of this main circuit board. I need to desolder the defective component, so I need to have access to the back side of the board for that. So this board was very simple to remove. These two connectors on the bottom just plug into place down here. These two ribbon cables attach to the side right here and over here. And then the IEEE 488 connector on the back panel has two screws that attach it to the back panel. I had to remove this panel because this board needs to unplug straight up like this and with this uh, protruding through the back panel right here, um, I couldn't get it out away from this. So this panel needed to be removed. Very easy to do because there's just two screws in the bottom corner. Nothing else attaches to this panel. So very simple to disassemble. Now the integrated circuit of course needs to be mounted in the correct position or orientation on the board. So you can see on the integrated circuit itself, right here there's a little dot on the integrated circuit and all ICs typically will have that dot or some kind of a marking on the end. Sometimes they'll have a little notch out on the end right here as well. So whether there's a notch or a little dot, this is pin one right here. So you count one, two, three, four, five, and six. So that's the how the numbering on an integrated circuit works. You go down this side and over and then back up that side. All right. Now on the circuit board, you can see See right here is the defective component. And you can see on the unpopulated areas right here, they have an outline where the integrated circuit could go, right? other configurations or so on. And it's just easy to see here, every integrated circuit has it. In fact, if I tip it, there, you can see kind of the line underneath the one that will be removed. But you can see what they've done right here is a little a notch indication. So that's showing that this is pin one. So you count one, two, three, four, five, and six. You can see on the one we're going to replace, it actually faces the other direction. So while these are with the, the pin one up here in the upper left corner, the one that we're gonna replace is actually flipped around. You can see its notch is right there. The little dot is right there. So this is actually one, two, three, and then over four, five, and six. So of course, not all integrated circuits are positioned the same way on a given circuit board. So you definitely need to watch that because it's very important that they be installed in the correct direction. So I will desolder that component and we'll get the new one uh, in place. Before I can use my desoldering tool to actually desolder the component, you can see they've bent the leads over on the back side of the board. So they really didn't trim the, the leads off. They've just kind of uh, bent them over and then made the solder connection. So I can't put the desoldering tool down onto the pin directly. So I'm gonna straighten these pins up first before I attempt to desolder them. So I'll grab my soldering iron and come in here like so. Straighten those up like that. All right, so you can see that just gets those pins facing straight up so that I can get my desoldering tool right down onto those and um, desolder. Okay, now I'm ready to desolder the connections on the circuit board. So for that, I have my desoldering tool. It's set for about 700 degrees, which I find is kind of a go-to temperature for re general repair work like this. If you had a board that had uh, thicker traces or heavier gauge uh, component leads, you might need to increase that temperature, but 700 degrees is kind of a go-to temperature for general soldering or desoldering work. Now, I have not added any solder to these connections. Sometimes you need to add a little bit of fresh solder to help it flow a little bit better than desolder completely. So we'll try one, and if it works okay, then I don't need to add solder. If it's a little bit stubborn, then we'll add a little bit of fresh solder. Pardon the noise. The uh, vacuum pump is a little bit loud on the camera. 
it looks like that's working okay. Desoldered completely there. When you're desoldering with a tool like this, you want to use a circular motion, work around the component uh, lead to make a complete uh, vacuum and, and clear out the uh, hole that goes through the circuit board so that it vacuums out the solder completely. If you just come in here like this and just don't move the gun at all and just hold it steady, it won't necessarily pull all the solder. You sort of want to use that circular motion and that really works well. from the board. All right, here's the new component. I've just dropped it right into the position there on the board. The little dot on the corner right there lined up again with the little notch in the silk screen outline. What I like to do is solder one of the uh, leads on the component and then just take my finger and squeeze the component down against the board, heat that one more time, just to make sure that it's completely pulled down flush. Sometimes you'll feel it just move just a little bit further so that everything's in place there. You can also bend the leads over a little bit just to help it hold, but it was pretty much staying in place on its own. All right, the power supply is now reassembled to the point that I can test it. So the main control circuit board is back in place and the rear panel has been reinstalled. So it's time to test it and see if the problem is taken care of. And what do you think? Did the one little integrated circuit solve everything? Or is there something else lurking in here that we don't know about? Let's find out. So position it here so you can see the front panel. And I'll grab my power cord here. Alright, and I'll turn the AC outlet is on. Alright, let's find out. Well, not too bad. Not too bad at all. It's not doing that weird jumping around with the voltage and current fluctuating all over and the constant current, constant voltage indicator was flashing and overload and all those kind of things that were going on. So that's good to see. So let's see if it responds. If we do voltage, say 10 volts, enter. That looks good. So it accepts the voltage. Output off, output on. Current set, four. Four amps is the maximum. So that would put that into constant current mode if it went up to a four amp at that point. Basically where the, the amperage setting is where the constant current would take over. So if you go current set, let's see, five. Yeah, it just says current set max would be four. This is, we know it's a four amp output uh, is the maximum. So, all right. So now the next thing is to take a look and see if the voltage output looks uh, accurate. I'll hook it up to my voltmeter. We'll take a look at that. I'll put it on the oscilloscope. Let's take a look at the any noise and ripple on the output, make sure that looks okay and we'll do a load test on it and just make sure that it's able to handle a full load at the uh, full rated output voltage. So I'll reposition the camera a little bit and let's take a look at the output voltage first. All right, I have the Kepco power supply connected to my Hewlett Packard 3456A digital voltmeter. So let's take a look at the output voltage from the power supply and see if it looks stable and if the reading on the voltmeter agrees with the digital display on the power supply. Now, the power supply is on the bench and the voltmeter is up on the next shelf, so I can't really show both in the same shot, so I'll describe what I'm doing at the power supply and what its readings are on the display, 
You can see over here the test leads go off of the voltmeter and down to the power supply. Now the numbers you, that you see on the display right now are basically just slight noise on the test leads or just a very, very small voltage, residual voltage maybe on the output terminals. Uh, that's microvolts because that negative three on the display means you would move the decimal point three places to the left. So you have millivolts and then down to microvolts. So that's basically 200 and some microvolts right now. So very, very small voltage. It will auto range and change when I put the actual voltage uh, and turn the power supply on. All right, so let's start with uh, say five volts and see how that works. So output on, voltage set is five, enter. Okay, so the power supply says 4.989. Uh, 4 so that looks very, very close. No problems there. 4.9956. The power supply now says 4.995, so basically in agreement there, no issues with that. Let's go voltage 10. So it says 9.996. Okay, very, very close, no problems with that. Try voltage set, let's go 20 volts. So I've got 19.999 on the display on the power supply and 19.998, so that looks very good. Let's try a full voltage output, we'll go voltage set 25, enter. So it says 24.993, now it went to 25, so 25 and then 000. So that looks very close, 24.995. So not too bad, looks like it is working very well, looks very stable not changing or drifting or jumping around at all, so. All right, the next thing that I will do is I'll connect an oscilloscope to the output of the power supply, and let's make sure that the output doesn't have any excessive noise or ripple or any issues going on like that. So I'll reposition the camera and we'll take a look on the scope. All right, I have the Kepco power supply connected to my Tektronix 2465B oscilloscope. So you can see the scope probe is connected over here to the positive and the negative output terminals. The power supply is set to 25 volts. It's displaying 24.993, but again, I typed in 25. That's what it displays because that's what it is measuring on its output terminals. The oscilloscope is set to AC coupling, so it's blocking any DC voltage from the power supply uh, to go into the scope, and on AC it just allows any uh, changing waveform, such as any ripple or noise, to get through, but again it blocks the DC. If you put this on DC for direct coupling, then and put this on 20 millivolts per division, the trace would go completely off screen, you wouldn't be able to see it. So again, to block that DC voltage from coming in, put the scope on AC. So at 20 millivolts per division, we can see a little bit of noise and a little bit of ripple right here but does not look excessive at all. The oscilloscope is set to 20 megahertz bandwidth limiting. It's a 400 megahertz oscilloscope and there's nothing in this power supply that extends beyond 20 megahertz or anything like that. So it helps us to clean up the display a little bit by turning the bandwidth limiting on. So if I set this to ground right here, this is ground reference. You can see it's on the center graticule. So again, back to AC, we can see a little bit of a ripple. Very, very slight. And it may be a little bit hard to see on the camera, but there are some repetitive noise pulses, it looks like, right in here. So what I've done is place these uh, cursors, which are measuring voltage, uh, about the peak of those pulses, the best I could see. So they're very faint, they happen very quickly, and I don't know that it shows up on the camera all that well, but it looks like the peak of these pulses are right where those cursors are. So the uh, di voltage between those cursors is 36 millivolts. So very small, any noise on the output is very, very slight, very small. I'll bring those cursors down a little bit closer and we'll look at that slight fluctuation that we have. Slight ripple, very close, looks like right about there. So where it's set, it looks like about seven millivolts. And I'm looking right at that uh, center where it fluctuates just a little bit and it looks like that's probably about seven millivolts. I don't know, maybe, maybe six, six or seven, somewhere around there. Mm, 
Yeah, seven. I think seven's pretty reasonable. I'll bring the camera in a little bit closer to the screen. Pardon the camera movement. See that a little bit better there. But certainly nothing excessive. It looks like the output is very clean for a switch mode power supply. So it looks like there's uh, filtering and it looks like the filtering is working correctly in the power supply. No defective capacitors or anything like that that we need to worry about. So the next thing that I'll do, the final test, will be to put a full load uh, on the power supply. So for that I'll connect the power supply to my dyno load. I will reposition the camera and I'll show you that test. Okay, I have the Kepco power supply connected to my dyno load. Now you see the voltage of the dyno load shows 24.98. The power supply is indicating 24.993. The dyno load accuracy on its voltmeter is not as high of accuracy as we saw on the Hewlett Packard uh, 3456A digital voltmeter. It's very close, but it's not quite to that same accuracy. So um, that voltage will also drop on the dyno load's display when it's under load because there's some long cabling between the dyno load and the power supply. So. Uh, a slight drop or you know, occur a little voltage drop in those cables. All right, so we'll start with a two amp load. So constant current mode on the dyno load, two amps, enter. All right, so we see 24.91 for the voltage. Looks very good. Power supply says exactly 25. Now it says 24.993 again. So no problems with those readings. And the power supply is indicating 2.0282 for its current. And we see two amps up there, exactly. So the readings are very, very close. Now, if I go to current, we'll try three, enter. Again, that looks very good. 3.03 on the display down here on the power supply. So no problems with that. Now, if I go to constant current up here and four, and enter, you can see that just falls away. It says a system fault. The reason it does that is because this is trying to draw a constant four amps, but the power supply goes into constant current mode at four amps, and its voltage begins to drop lower and lower, and it begins to be an endless loop as this is trying to hold the current at four amps up here. The power supply and the dyno load basically fight each other when the dyno load's in the constant current mode. So what we need to do is put this in constant resistance I'll put it at, say, 5 ohms. So this is now acting like a 5 ohm fixed resistor, if you think of it that way. You can see it's now in the constant current mode. We've got 3.97 amps, so almost 4, very, very close. And the voltage has fallen and is holding to 19.79. The power supply indicates 19.94 and constant current of 4 amps. So the numbers look very close, no issues with those. I go constant resistance, we'll drop it to 2 ohms. You can see that voltage uh, does fall a little bit further. The power supply is indicating 8.070. Dyno load says 7.9, so a little bit of voltage drop, but uh, those cables, but not, nothing excessive there, that looks okay. And the current 3.97 is holding. And the power supply continues to show 4 amps. So it is working very well. It's resistance, 6 ohms. So that brings us back up near the full output voltage. It's still in constant current mode, 4 amps, and almost a full output there. Constant resistance, try 7. So with a 7 ohm load, you can see it's uh, back to constant voltage mode on the power supply. It says 3.5933, so 3.57, numbers are very close. And we're back to 24.993 on the power supply, and dyno load says 24.86. So at this point, it looks like the power supply repairs are complete. It's functioning very well, and uh, it's ready to be put back into service on the bench. The repairs on the Kepco ABC254DN power supply are now complete. It's functioning very well, and with just the replacement of this one little part, keeps that power supply out of the landfill and puts it back into service on the bench. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure to give a thumbs up. 
And if you're enjoying the videos on this channel, don't forget to subscribe. So until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye.